Welcome to Rest, which stands for a Resiliency and Empowerment Seminar today. I am your host, Susan Gans, and I am a business strategist with Gans Strategic Solutions, where we work at the intersection of business and human behavior. This show is about talking to leaders of small, mid-sized businesses, heads of nonprofits, and other community leaders to hear about their professional journeys, to shine a light on their organizations, and to hear how they're being resilient, especially in these challenging times. I'm so excited to have my business school friend and colleague with me today, Jeannie McPhillip. Jeannie is a real life super girl with a vision to spread girl power all over the world. And she is a force, let me tell you. She is in the business of inspiration as the founder of Supergirls, empowering women to launch into their next chapter. She is a best-selling author, and campus speaker slash girl advocate. She's a recovering fashionista who realized that life after 7th Avenue was more than a fabulous shoe closet. Instead, it was about paying it forward to help lift up the next generation of younger sisters by providing life tools such as mentorship, networking access, and career clarity. The shoes, however, make the journey all so much better. <laughs> Her mission with Supergirls is to inspire college women to find their inner hero and conquer the world as they launch. Most of her life, she inspired business teams to fight the good fight in commerce and fashion. Now, after teaching college for six years, the mission has evolved to superhero levels to empower her younger sisters to find their wings and fly. Leveraging her own network of girl mentors and online content, Supergirls wants to disrupt the way college girls are graduating into big girls. As I mentioned, she has an MBA from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, and a BBA from the College of William and Mary. She can be found on the campus at NYU where she inspires young global minds in the disciplines of digital commerce and entrepreneurship. She is married to her favorite Irish rogue, Jimmy, and blessed with a handsome son, Mark, who just graduated. Congratulations, Magna Cum Laude from Connecticut College. And her family wouldn't be complete without her furry friends, which are two toy fox terriers, Tanner and Clark, and the princess kitty, Lucy. Welcome to the show, Jeannie. Thank you. Here we are, Supergirls. We have arrived on the rest show. What a treat to be here with you today. I'm so excited and thank you for that amazing intro. Oh my god. That was, woo! I'm, I'm winded from that, but uh, happy to have flown in from Supergirl Planet to be here with you guys today. I so appreciate it, Jeannie, because you have uh, such strong messages to, to share with the world. So let's take a, a, a flight back in time, so to speak, and tell me more and the audience more about the early part of your career and your journey and how you got into this uh, marketing prowess and then into being a superhero with Supergirls. Okay. We might have to take the mask off for this. Okay. Going back in time. <laughs> Whoa, where do I start? It's been a long journey. Time flies. Okay. Um, so I started my career. I, I bounced out of college. I went to the College of William & Mary. Um, I got out. I couldn't wait to get out and start working. <clears throat> and I had done an internship in retailing between my junior and senior year, and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with fashion. I fell in love with the pace and the people, and it was the 80s, and it was just rocking. So I chased my dreams to New York City, and I worked for Macy's and all the department store chains in merchandising, buying, fashion, uh, design. <clears throat> but that lasted a little while, and then I got really um, antsy about you know moving forward and ambitious and stuff. So I went back to get my MBA at Wharton, and that's what we met. Yeah, Can't believe that was 25 years ago, oh my God. <laughs> but even when I graduated with a degree in marketing <clears throat> in entrepreneurship, because I knew it, it was in my DNA to start my own business, I was always really scrappy. And when you're in retail and fashion, 
in the eighties, it was really entrepreneurial back then. Like it was different than it is now. And people really had a lot of, I don't know, autonomy in what they bought, like whatever department. So we were in the dress, I was in the dress division and you really had a lot of autonomy about what you put on your selling floor and how you built your business. And I love that, you know, I love that kind of empowerment. So I wanted to jump the ranks really fast. So I went back to get my MBA. When I, after I got it though, I went right back into retail. Um, in business school, you're just tempted by all these other tintillating ideas like Wall Street yeah. and consulting <laughs> and uh, corporate America. And not that retailing and fashion was in corporate America, but you know, different avenues. And um, I ran right back to what I knew because I just missed the pace. Uh, and I love the fashion and the fast, everything changes all the time. It's like change is the only constant. <clears throat> yeah. So I went back and I did a different stint. I went back into specialty store retail and I learned all about product development and <clears throat> building businesses from that perspective and really starting from the ground up from inception to completion. Like I worked for the limited, I worked for QVC uh, and all that. So somewhere along the line so I, that was about i don't know maybe two-thirds of my career was in traditional commerce and then i realized that you know the world was going digital i was working for a research company i was doing retail research for hedge funds and mutual funds and realized oh my god this is like this digital thing is exploding i need to really upskill myself i need to transition and really stay relevant if i'm going to stay working i need to stay relevant so i hopped off I jumped off a cliff and I started working in fashion tech startups because it was the intersection of technology and fashion. And I really wanted to learn those skills. And it's it, when you're in something for a really long time and you try to make a change, sometimes you can't just make the change, you know, directly. You have to take like side steps. And that's like what I did with the, the startups. They like your experience, but you know, and you get to do so many things. You get to really learn, learn so many things. It's different than where it's not stable. I did three startups in two years. Wow. That was a rough ride, but I learned so much. And during that journey, I was able to, I networked a ton because when you're working for startups, you're pitching your business, your value proposition, you're networking with other people in the startup community. You're trying to figure out your business model. You're, you're networking your face off. And um, I, I ran into people who were teachers at NYU. And they said, you know, you would be a really good teacher. What, have you ever thought about it? Well, it's kind of in my DNA because I always liked coaching and mentoring. I was an RA in college. And I was a cheerleader in high school, right, Susan? We have that in common. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Once a cheerleader, always a cheerleader. Um, yeah. And I was a mom. I mean, you know, I have this kind of thing in my DNA. And so I said, you know what, let's, let's go for it. So I became a teacher at NYU, an adjunct professor. I taught at the Parsons School. I taught at NYU and I taught at Berkeley College in New York and New Jersey. Yeah. Loved it. Loved the energy of the classroom. Loved the ability to add value. Loved the students learning from the students. That was like an incredible thing that I just really didn't, you know, really grasp until I was actually like, you know, teaching and realizing how much of a give and take that classroom experience really is. So that was amazing to me. And that <clears throat> is what inspired me to start Supergirls. Um, it start, that was the start because I, realized that you know I was they were they were drawn to me students were drawn to me I have this kind of attraction I had this rapport with them mostly women okay yeah. and I knew that I was helping them and they would stay in touch with me even when, after the class was over I coached them on relationships I coached them on networking I coached them on career uh, job search stuff and I, I thought I felt like something was there but I continued to work you know I did consulting and then, and then I was I had a few uh, executive level positions in the digital commerce space because now I was, you know, a force at that point, you know, I was, I had expertise. And so I, I said, you know, I need to follow this and just go with this because I loved, I love leading a team and, you know, let's face it. That's what we were trained for. You know, we went to business school. We were trained to run yeah. businesses. So this was like, you know, Shangri-La. I was like, whoop, this is awesome. 
But when that ended, I thought, oh my God, now what? You know, like, I, I thought this was going to go on forever, but it doesn't, okay? Like, you don't do that. Like, when you're in business, at some point, you know, it, you're not as relevant anymore at a certain age. It's the truth. I mean, we don't like to say it. We don't like to admit it, but it's the truth. That's why we become board members. We become advisors. We become teachers. Um, so I thought, okay, I, I want to take all this value all this these learnings and I, I need to pay it forward i need to help the next generation i need to inspire them because i saw what a disconnect it was from when you went you're in college and then graduate and you're just kind of lost and they just need some help and guidance and i saw a white space there and that's where that's what inspired me for supergirls that's so amazing there's a couple of things from your story i want to draw out one is change you mentioned that change is a constant and I totally agree with you. How do you get comfortable with change? Just knowing that change is coming, right? Cause we're in a lot of change right now. So what can you share with our audience about change? <clears throat> so I think when you're about to make a change, so I'm about to make a change myself. So I'm just gonna speak from my own um, experience on this particular one that's gonna happen. So I'm about to make a change to uh, continue to run Supergirls, but I'm going to be teaching full time at Savannah College of Art and Design, um, which to me is the intersection of everything I'm trying to, uh, you know, my life's work. It's, everything's aligning and it feels really cool. So how do you think about that? Well, you really have to get grounded in what is not changing so that when you do make the change, your, your feet are on the ground. So in other words, what does that mean for me? family, okay, my, my, my partner, my husband, partner in crime, um, is he on board with me, you know, is he, are we aligned on the whole issue of making the change, because it involves a relocation, um, my son, how does he feel about it, you know, is he, you know, so kind of getting your, your posse together, and then also in the girl power space, because let's, let's face it, you, Susan and I are like in this new group we created called the Wharton Boss Queens. And uh, it's about just, you know, talking to your peers, your peeps, your tribe about the change and what you're expecting, what you're, you know, what you're anticipating and how can you, what are, how are ways to make it easier? Or what are things you should be thinking about or, you know, anticipate? Um, and then, but also continuing, like I said, like what, what are things that keep you grounded? Like your, your workout routine, your meditation routine, your prayer. I'm a very spiritual person to make sure that I stay connected with my higher power. Like all these things are not changing. You have to like keep that bond really close. Your friends, even though I'm going to have to move to a new city and I'm going to have to make all new friends, new friends at work, new friends in the community, um, I always stay connected whenever I make a change with the people that are all, have been my, in my community. Because this way you don't really feel like, yeah, some things are changing, but other things that are most important to you are staying the same and you're not like completely flipping out. That's so important. I think what you're talking about is having structure and routine um, on a daily basis to when you're grounding and also what I, I take from you is also being surrounded by your support system in all areas of your life, your, your family on board, your, your friends that you'll maintain and you'll make new friends, but having that um, strong foundation in your life, if you will. No, I mean, I, you're right. That's exactly right. What I love about you is you always know how to, you always know how to put things. So they sound so like neat and tied up in a bow. <laughs> that is exactly right. And I'm going to say like, I've been through a, a, like a lot of big changes in my life. One in particular was when I got divorced from my first husband. Luckily this is only number two. So hopefully that's going to be the end of that. But, um, um, the thing is, like you said, your support system, if I didn't have my girls, my friends, my mom, my sister, my girlfriends to get me through that. I mean, there is like no way. I mean, I, I was a mess. I was a mess. I, I had like a breakdown, you know, um, I had, a, I call it my dark years. And it was like, I'll never forget. We, we went to get our nails done. It was my mom and my sister. And I was talking to the girl, 
you know, the girl that was doing my nails and about it. And I started to cry and she's like, you're going to cry a thousand tears. Maybe she said a million. I don't know. And then she hands me this pack of cigarettes. She goes, you know, you're going to need these. You're going to cry a thousand tears and you're going to need these cigarettes and you need <laughs> your girlfriends. I'm telling you right now, this is what you're going to need. And I just remember that moment because it's so true. And in the same thing in college, like I was in a sorority in college and it was so hard for me. College was really difficult for me because I was like the shit in high school. And then I go to college and it was like, what, what just happened here? Like, I'm not smart anymore. <laughs> All these people, I was getting killed. And I was, you know, the sorority was like my support system. And if I didn't have those girls, I never would have gotten through undergrad, like I in one piece. And uh, seriously, I had a, a big sister who was like my mentor through uh, college and a big sister in the sorority. Yes. And that's another thing that really inspires me for Supergirls because women together, there's just a magical bond about women together and helping each other because we have similar issues, similar problems, similar challenges. And men are cool, but women just, it, it doesn't compare. So that brings up a question I have about the importance of mentors and sponsors over over time and have your mentors and sponsors changed. And I know you're a big mentor um, and inspiration to girls and women. So, so talk to us about mentorship and sponsorship. Love this topic. So I didn't even know it, but my big sister in college was like my very first mentor. Um, Actually, no, I, sh I shouldn't say that. Even in high school, my, our, our cheerleading coach was my first mentor. She helped me. She went to Bucknell. She got me all excited about college. I wanted to go to Bucknell. She helped me write the essay, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I had no idea, like, that was, like, a mentorship, right? Because I had my mom. I was the oldest. Back then, we didn't talk about, you know, we didn't have a girl. I don't know. This thing wasn't really out there. I mean, maybe it was happening, but it wasn't, like, a thing. Um, then in college, I had my big sister who basically picked me up when I fell down like a lot and my sorority sisters. And uh, then when I, when I started working, if I had had someone at that point to help mentor me like right when I started, I think it would have gone a lot smoother for me. Um, it, let me tell you something. Retail in the 80s was t a tough spot. Girls were mean. They were bitchy. And girls didn't help each other. Women didn't really help each other that much. It was like dog eat dog. It was a female dominated business, but that didn't matter because they just were mean. And one time my boss, I made a mistake and she gave me this, she would give me the silent treatment. And it was terrible. I mean, she did it more, more than once. And it was like, how, how am I supposed to communicate with this woman if she's giving me the silent treatment? I mean, but the point is, it's the anti, it's the anti mentor thing happening there, yes. right? Yes. So I landed in another job at at one point where I had an incredible mentor. I'm still friends with her today, and she completely changed my whole outlook, perspective, career path. She was incredibly inspirational, and I actually had her. I have a podcast, and I had her as a guest in my podcast, and she had a quote about mentorship, saying, "Mentoring is in the moment." And what, that, what she meant by that was, it doesn't matter if someone's older, younger, it doesn't matter about that. It's just, how can you learn and get inspired by someone and helps you through a particular time in your life when you need it? Or, or, it, or it, it's good or bad. I mean, yeah. it's in the moment you learn from people. Like, I mean, I learned from you, Susan. I learned from you. Things that you're doing, I feel like, you know, she's an awesome mentor. She, she helped, you helped inspire me on certain things. This is what mentors do for each other, you know, um, or for, for you. And I really believe that, like you said, it changes. I think it changes over time. It definitely changed for me. Like, I don't have one that's been my lifelong mentor. I have people that are still in my life that have mentored me in certain situations. Uh, I mean, my mom, an incredible mentor. I mean, you don't, I don't call her that, but that's really what she's been for me. I mean, I watch her and I see, and she's, especially in relationships, she inspires me so much on how to stay in a long-term and be happy and in a long-term relationship <laughs> because it's really hard. Yes. And she's married 56 years. I mean, that's a long time. And it's like, okay, how do you do this? Um, so I think, you know, and I, I do, I mentor so many college women 
Uh, and it's so rewarding for me. It's just so, I, I absolutely feel like, because I, I really wish people had been there to do that for me, but you know, I didn't necessarily seek it out either. Right. I, I was, I was kind of a bull in a China shop kind of a person, you know, got to do this, got to check this out, got to take this risk. Now I feel like, you know, I, I, I approach things a little differently, <laughs> but that's what mentors help you with, right? They help you maybe with your blind spot. Okay. Have you thought about that? Yeah. Or I would think maybe think about it this way or consider this option versus that, or don't forget to think about this. So that's a really important, those are important things to help because you can't do it all. You can't do it alone. It's impossible. Exactly. That's where the, the support system, the posse comes into to play. I have a question for you about common themes that you might see in your mentoring. Are there themes that you're seeing over and over with the girls, college women, other women that you mentor? Yes. Um, so they all it's, it's interesting you asked me that because I'm actually developing an app right now around this problem because I, I believe that for the Supergirls business, um, I believe this is a huge, the biggest pain point. So of all the pain points that I see with these women, it would be uh, financial literacy in terms of understanding how to support themselves when they graduate. What does that look like? You know, trying to get a handle on that. That's a huge pain point because they have no, most of them have no idea. Maybe they're working, maybe they're saving money, but they just haven't really had to think about it and plan. Planning is a big pain point for them. I don't want to plan. I'm not going to plan. I'm, like, I'm not going to plan five years. I don't even know what I want to do tomorrow. I'm not, I, I don't, I don't want to put that on paper. Not knowing and understanding that that can change, you know, it changes. Yes. Um, networking. That is the biggest pain point. That's when I'm building, uh, developing my app around the concept of networking. And the other theme is, um, you know, personal branding. How do you put yourself out there? How do you talk about your value? How do you sh demonstrate that when you really don't have a lot of experience? They struggle with that. So I help them a lot with that because it's like, you know, there's all, you have no idea what value you add, but you do add, you, you don't know, but I know I can see it, you know, cause I'm a teacher and I can put it together and I can help you. And you just have, you have no idea what you, how powerful you really are. Uh, networking is the biggest because they don't understand what that means. A lot of people think, oh, networking is just calling people and asking them about if there's jobs in their company or you know, how can they get me to a job? And they think it's like two calls, bing, bang, you're done. No, it's like, it's about building relationships. And they know you and I know that. And we yeah. understand and we've worked that over the years. And I would like to help them fast track that. So they don't, they have that, the, again, the network, because that's what, that's what works. That's what gets you, helps you, moves you forward in life is the network. Personally, professionally. Absolutely. I used to be under the mistaken impression, even after Wharton, that if I just put my head down and did the work, of course I would be noticed. But what I did finally notice <laughs> was that my mm -hmm. male counterparts were going into the partner's offices and the senior manager's offices and building a relationship around sports and communicating about what projects they were working on. So when those awesome consulting assignments came along, they were top of mind. And I finally did get that memo, but I wish I did have somebody tapping me on the shoulder and said, hey girl, pick up your head, go walk around, make relationships. This is your next level. What worked in the past is not gonna get you to where you wanna go in the future. So. Oh my God. I, I know that is like, it's like, I wish I could put neon signs on the highway because it, it, it is so, it, it's like a, it's subtle, right? Like I, I, I'm going to give you an example. I was on a call um, a couple of weeks ago with Connecticut college. So I'm involved in their parents committee. We help we try to help we coach the kids and try to help them with all these things we're talking about. 
And so um, a, a lot of recent grads were on the call and we were kind of coaching them. And there was, there was actually a, a, an alumni. So there's parents and alumni involved. Okay. And one of the alums works for Blue Bloods. She's a, an assistant producer on the Blue Bloods show. Um, and that's a really tough space, you know, to get in. You really have to be like an unbelievable networker. And, and we were talking about, I was ta they were saying, how do you, when you reach out to people on LinkedIn and then you have a call, like, what do you say? How do you talk to these people? How do you keep the relationship going? I'm like, find the common thing. Like you were just saying like sports, whatever. I said, animals, pets. And the, the woman, her name was Nikki from Blue Blood. She said, I'm telling you, I talk, I realized my current boss has a specific kind of dog. I don't remember the breed. And I have a dog, a beagle, and we were talking about it, the dogs. And I'm telling you, she goes, I'm telling you, that's how I started the relationship with this person. Even though we went to the same college, we had the same alumni and alma mater, and it was like a thing. And so it's as subtle as that, like talking about your dog or your cat, just finding a common bond with people and starting. That's how you start. It's just like going to a bar when you're like meeting people in a bar. It's the same thing. You find a common or, you know, a guy you think is cute. You find something you want to talk to them about. But, you know, how do you translate that into the professional thing? Yeah. There's, they see it very some of them see it very separate, like the personal and the professional. I find the ones that have, uh, see it more joined, the lines less blur, uh, more blurred are the ones that are understanding how to network and getting moving forward this way. But those aren't as many as I would like to see. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about that because I, think I, I shared with you, I used to feel like I was, um, three people in when I was earlier in my career, there was Susan, the business person, Susan, the family person, Susan, the community person. And it gets really hard to be three people. Oh my God. I know it's hard enough to be one. <laughs> and when I finally learned how to be just be, that was so liberating. But I think there's this, conception I'm, I'm not sure if it's you know we somehow see it in school or learn it or hear it that we have to be separate and we can't just talk like there's certain things you're not allowed to talk about in business can you can you elaborate on sort of this thematic of just being <laughs> authentic <laughs> yeah I think um I, th I agree with you I don't know where that came from uh and it's definitely more prevalent in certain industries. So you're, you've been in finance, consulting, those are more formal. And I think that those are more, uh, you know, there's more rules around that kind of stuff in there um, versus a cr more creative industries. Like I've been in the, on the fashion side and people just let it all hang out much, whether it helps or not, <laughs> you know, fashion designers yeah. and that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's, it's being your authentic, I think it's trying to figure, it's a, it's a tough line between your balancing your, and being confident. So one of the things I, I really like to try to help these girls with, and that's why I have, I have them on the podcast to help them to share their story is, and bring out their personalities to understand that this, this is the value that you add to the community is your personality and your special sauce, whatever that is. So yes. being authentic around that without, without giving too much away, like, you know, who you slept with over the weekend or whatever, you know, it's a point, there's a point where you can still say, I went out and had a great time in the Hamptons and I, you know, bar hopped versus, you know, giving all of the details. <laughs> yeah. Opening the curtain. Right. So there's a, there's a thing, but I think that that's okay. I mean, because I think either that's how you decide whether or not who your real people are and where you really fit. So if you're not that, you're going to walk around like for years in a fog, like not knowing, not experiencing life. I mean, it's like love. Do you fully love someone or do you guard your heart because you're afraid you're going to get hurt? How are you ever going to understand and experience what that's really like if you don't step off and just let it go? I mean, you don't know. You don't know. And so in business, it's the same thing. How do you know? if that's the right fit for you, if you don't try it as yourself. 
Because if you try it as someone else, then you're stifling yourself. You're stifling your essence. Yes. yes. Your Carlness. We recently rewatched that movie, You, Me, and Dupree. <laughs> he talks <laughs> about your, the guy's name was Carl, your Carlness. So, like, your Susan Ness, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that brings me to my next question about empowerment. Because a lot of what you're talking about and doing is reminding each person that they do have the power within. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I, you know what it is? Uh, the, my favorite quote about that is from a movie called Sucker Punch. It was like circa 2011. And um, it was this it was this movie about, I'm sorry, I do a lot with films and movies and quotes. I do a lot in teaching and it just helps bring it to life. But it was a movie about this woman who was in this, she was entrapped in this uh, prison and they, they, what, what they did is they thought they were, if they thought they were crazy, they would give them a lobotomy. And so it was, it was like, they were trapped. And so she was entrapped in her own mind. And how does she get out? And she meets these people in this fantasy that give her these weapons to help her break out. And the one woman gave her, taught her how to dance for this. She had to do a specific dance to get to a specific weapon that she needed. And she said, you have all the weapons you need. Now fight. So the girl was really scared about doing the dance, but she said to her, you have it all. You have it. It's inside. You just have to fight. You have to figure out what it is and then fight, like, you know, go after it. So that's important to figure out what, again, your special sauce, what you bring to the world, what it is. And I don't think, uh, you know, I think it's getting better in education now. I think they start in high school. They start helping uh, kids understand what their passions are and how they can bring that to the world and kind of follow that like where they go to college or you know if they go to liberal arts school or if they go to a design school or whatever it is what school they go to what people they are friends with so i think it's starting to get better depending on the school uh depending on the educators and then in college again it depends on the school like you know they in liberal arts they say you know what study what you love because it doesn't matter as much what you major in unless you're going to specifically be in a trade like a doctor or a lawyer, you know, whatever else you do, it's in college, study what you love because that's how you're going to flourish. So in terms of your empowerment or like that feeling empowered, I think it's around what you said earlier, like you being your authentic self and knowing what that is. What do you love? Like for me, I love helping people. I love uh, paying it forward. I love teaching. And so I, you know, it took me a long time to get here, but maybe I wouldn't have been as effective of a teacher, as an educator, as a coach, if I didn't go through all the other experiences in my life where I was trying to figure out who the authentic person was, you know? Right. Um, so, so you have to go through those experiences too, to also understand and take risks and understand like, it's okay to do this. It's okay. You, you, you could change the plan. Plan doesn't have to stay, you know, linear. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it wasn't something until um, maybe 10 to 15 years out of business school that I learned that your career doesn't have to be like stepladder, because I think that's what we were shown. But rather, many of our careers, I remember being at this alumni women's event, and we had to raise our hands if our careers weren't stepladder. And I was... Um, so thrilled to see that I wasn't alone, that about 75% of the people in the room had one of these sorts of careers like I did, and I felt less alone. I thought that I was the only one that had a career that um, wasn't like this. And, and so that lesson, the more that we can get that lesson out, that careers look in different ways success look in, in different ways it's it that is to me is very empowering as well so yeah like what does success mean to you versus other people and the empowering thing also is the fact that again it's women other women helping other women making you feel like 
you're part of a team, you're part of a group, you're part of this community. Um, I mean, what you all had in common, you had the Wharton thing in common and you still felt like, you know, the career, it, it, it felt okay. Like it was, it, it was acceptable um, yes. because of that, because you had that in common too, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah, there, there, I, I do think that the networking too <clears throat> and the women's support, the groups supporting each other help you to have, be able to make those changes. So in other words, not being stuck doing something that maybe isn't making you happy anymore. Having people telling you it's okay, or I did this, or I can help you make that change because I know so-and-so that you can talk to. So like, you know, I, us being around doing these kind of things for other women and the next generation is like helpful for them because they have choices now. They have more choices. We always had yes. choices, but it's easier, I think. But they don't know it's easier because they haven't seen the hard way. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> so that brings me to the question about resilience. What does resilience mean to you? How are you being resilient, especially in these times? I mean, you you shared all these different sort of changes in your life that you've taken risks and um, you've done different things. So talk, and you're about to make a change. And that's also, you know, it takes a lot of resilience to be able to do that. So, so talk to us about that. So resilience means being able to bounce back, being able to forge any challenges or any harm or any difficult things that may stand in your way and keep going. Would you agree with that statement or is that a good definition? Um, that definition resonates with me. It's just it's the, the, the strength to keep going and to, to really to, to persevere. And I, and I think with the, um, to be well positioned for that, again, it's going to go back to the mentors and, and your support system. So agree. Um, so agree. That's a huge part of it. Uh, the other part is having your own formula for your daily. It's a daily, it's a daily formula. Um, it's for me, it's prayer. It is physical working out exercise meditation. And, uh, uh, uh self love rituals. So what does that mean? Okay. It means looking in the mirror and saying, you know what? You got this. <laughs> Even though you completely screwed up last week, you failed at this. You, it's every day. It's like building this every day, but it helps to have people around you also telling you that, right? Because you can't, I, 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 I can't just do it myself. I have to have other people telling me that. I have to have my cat following me around <laughs> telling me, in her own way that I'm the bomb, right? Um, having women around is like the best. The, the, my friends, you know, and my mom and my sister, my friends and, and my community like you, I, I, telling you like, you know, it's okay if you have a bad day, if you have, you know, you gotta have, you gotta have the people, the sisters, you gotta have the network, you gotta have that to help like keep, keep moving forward, you know? And when you make a change, um, when you go through something really hard, like I said earlier, the, the, like the divorce, that was brutal. But I had to pick myself up. I had a son to raise, you know, I was like a single mom at that point. I was like, you know, this is like, this is, it's all about me. I got to figure this out. Um, but if you don't know who you are and you don't know what value you add to the world, it's really hard to stay resilient, you know? And if you don't feel good about that, that's, it's, it's, it's definitely more challenging. And that's what I see in these, these, young women that are graduating now, if they are, if they, once they start to see their value and really understand their value, they can get through whatever's going on now because there's a lot of crap that's going on now, but they can see, they can see the light at the end of the tunnel. If they're kind of mired in this victim mentality, like, oh, what, we, we didn't graduate. We didn't have a college senior year. We didn't graduate. Now we have all this. And they don't like, you know, they don't latch on to what they bring to the world, then that's when you have, you know, issues. But that's when they need, also need 
people like us to say, stand up, you know, stop, stop that. At some point you have to stop being a victim and be a victor, right? Like, come on, I got to come back from this now. Absolutely. So in closing, what would you like our audience to remember about our conversation that we've just had today? Only one thing. You can say a couple of phrases. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is my swan song from Sucker Punch. You have all the weapons you need. Now fight. Figure out how to fight. Figure out what your weapons are. Figure out what's inside because that is all part of what we do with Supergirls, helping people, like you said on the intro, figuring out your inner hero. And because you are, you stand in your own power once you figure that out. Awesome. Love it. You have all the weapons you need. So Jeannie, how can people find you? Because we do want people to find you and the amazing work you're doing. Okay, so when I'm not flying over the world, <laughs> leaping buildings in a single bound. <laughs> um, no, supergirls.com is two L's, a second L for love. And you can get my, you can email me, genie at supergirls.com, which is also two L's. I'm on Instagram, where all my girls are on Instagram, at supergirls, again, two L's, supergirls, two L's for love. Facebook and Twitter, same thing, supergirl. All right, so that's supergirls with two L's for love.com. Yes. Jeannie at supergirls.com. She's on Facebook, she's on Twitter. Jeannie, thank you so much for being here today and having this conversation. I so enjoyed it. And to our audience, thanks for tuning in and we look forward to the next conversation.